and you're just gonna do it this time. Well, I've got a top over there. Okay. So you're rolling? Yep. Okay. Uh, today's date is November 20th, 2012. The interviewee is Roald Hoffman. The interview interviewer is Peter Johans. And this interview is taking place in Ithaca, New York, in the United States of America. And then now we'll get a two shot. Give myself my two right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, and I'll talk as well too. Okay. Today is November twentieth, two thousand twelve. The interviewer, an uh, interviewee rather, is Roald Hoffman. The interviewer is Peter Johans. This interview is taking place in Ithaca, New York, in the United States of America. Sorry. <laughs> I said long leg. Yeah. And Rolla, just so I know we've had it, but could you again uh, say your name for us and yes. spell your first and last name and uh, give us your current title uh, or position? Yes, I am Roald Hoffman. Um, my first name is R-O-A-L-D. That's like Ronald without the N. And uh, I am at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. I have been here for 47 years. I am now the Frank H. D. Rhodes Professor of Humane Letters Emeritus and retired four years from Cornell University. And are you enjoying your retirement? Uh, yes, I'm more active than ever. I'm retired from teaching, but I'm active in research that continues and it's going very well. So, uh, Ron, tell me uh, certainly a little bit about the journey that brought you to uh, to Cornell, starting with, uh, with your childhood. Yes. So, I am the last generation of Hitler's gifts to America. Um, that is, I am a child of war-torn Europe, a survivor of the Holocaust, and then we lived in the United States. I'll tell you about each of these episodes. But there is a pretty clear division between the two, and that happened in 1949 when at age 11 and a half, my age, we came to America. But let's go back to before. So I was born on July 18, 1937, in a little town in southeast Poland called, in Polish, because it was Poland, Zwarczów. Zwarczów spelled Z-L-O-C-Z-O-W, and the L is a hard L, a Polish letter, and the O has a little accent over it, which makes it like an O. Uh, Zwarczow is now in the Ukraine. When my mother was born, it was Austria-Hungary. Poland did not exist for two centuries until the First World War. My mother was born in 1911. When I was born, it was Poland. The Soviet Union took it in after World War II, and then it became the now independent Ukraine the last 20 years. So it's a place that changed um, government's hands four times in one century. And unfortunately with that came several waves of what would be called today ethnic cleansing, and we were caught up in that. Zorchov was a town of about 12,000 people, uh, according to some late 30s census. Of those 12,000 people, about 4,000 were Polish, and about 4,000 were Ukrainian, and about 4,000 were Jewish. And we were in that Jewish, it, it wasn't, so it wasn't a shtetl, a, a small town. It was a typical small bourgeois town. And in fact, my grandfather uh, on one side was the keeper of a store with notions and sewing materials called the Galanteria. And uh, my father, Hillel Safran, so our na last name in those times was Safran, S-A-F-R-A-N. 
I'll tell you more about how we came to Hoffman in time. But I was born as Roald Safran, though my birth certificate doesn't exist as such. Uh, there's a story in the naming, how I got the name Roald, and uh, to tell it simply, uh, it was uh, after the Norwegian explorer who first reached the pole, the South Pole in 1911, Roald Amundsen. The writer Roald Dahl was also named after Roald Amundsen. I owe to Roald Dahl that people know how to spell my name. If they have children, they've read Roald Dahl stories. Uh, it is a Norwegian name. And there was a negotiation of Jewish identity and assimilationist times behind that name, but that's not important. I was born in 1937. The war broke out in uh, September 39, when the Germans invaded Poland, having reached uh, agreement with the Soviets, and they divided up Poland and we were in the Russian occupation zone. My father was a civil engineer. My mother had an education as a school teacher, though she didn't practice that. I was at this point, 1939, two years old. We have photographs from that time of me as a child, miraculously recovered after the war. Period 39 to 41 was difficult, but not bad for the Jewish population. It was rather bad for the Ukrainians because the Soviets viewed the Ukrainians as a nationalist movement and they imprisoned some of their intelligentsia, the teachers, doctors, lawyers, and eventually killed them. Uh, for the Jews, it wasn't that terrible. My mother tells of working for a Russian uh, boss in some company in town. I don't remember much. I was just two years old. I have very few childhood memories. Actually, uh, the two I have, um, one of a car that I had, a wooden car that was given to me, kind of car where you sort of get in, actually, a car, a big car, colored brightly is what I remember, and you had pedals in it. And I the other thing I remember is not so good as uh, eating a leaf of a plant, a house plant, and it was sour and bitter and crying about it. I don't remember anything of the war time, of the, of the uh, events. The really bad time for us began two years later, when in the last week of June of 1941, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, and they came into our part within about a week to ten days. I don't remember much again. I'm speaking now from, uh, from um, what I read, what my mother told me. I do remember uh, some sort of flight, and it was climbing from some balcony into some hiding place in the attic we had constructed. Because in, 1940, in that week in 1941, the first week of July 1941, I'm almost four years old at this point. There was a pogrom where uh, the Ukrainians rounded up the Jews and sent them up to the castle where uh, it seems SS Einsatzgruppe C and the Viking division were shooting the Jews. It was still partially discriminate. They were killing the men, but not the women at that point. In the roundup were caught my grandfather my on my mother's side and my uncle Abram. We were in hiding in this attic place we had constructed. And uh, my grandfather was shot at that time and killed. And my uncle Abram crawled out from among the dead at night and came back alive. He survived the war eventually. I'll tell you that in a moment. And in uh, he came to the United States, but to the end of his life he lived with pieces of a bullet in his hand, in his wrist, from that time. 
So we lost, right in that first week of the war, um, my grandfather. In the end, the war cost the lives of three out of four grandparents, but those, the other two died later on in 43. Uh, in um, 1940, um, so this was 1941, the first week. I don't remember much again. I was told that we remained in the town, in our house, the remainder of 41. And then in 42, we moved or we were moved to a labor camp outside the town. The labor camp was called Lotske. This was essentially slave labor gangs, Jews, under fairly minimal German supervision. Most of the camp guards were hangers-on, Romanians, uh, uh, Latvians, Lithuanians who worked with the Germans. There was one very cruel German officer, uh, Varzog, Friedrich Varzog, who was in charge of it. My mother would remembers being beaten by him. We were in that camp. There were not supposed to be any children in the camp. I was in that camp. The guards could be bribed. These were not an extermination camp. People died of typhus, typhoid, but not they weren't killed. And your, your father, was, as being a civil engineer and familiar with the, uh, the engineering within the town, was seen as a, a valuable kind of uh, commodity almost yes. within the, the camp. And so the labor, labor camp. So what was the labor? The labor was the reconstruction of the roads that the, some of the Soviets had blown up some bridges and some of the roads. They also were building a supply road for German supplies to go east into Russia, where the front was. My father was of value to them because he was a civil engineer. He had built some of those uh, roads, culverts, bridges in that area. And the camp was mainly run by an Austrian construction company working. Well, Austria was part of Germany at this point. He was of value to them. And the one piece of testimony we have, and one of the few surviving documents we have from the wartime, are four or five passes signed by the German authorities, which say in German, we authorize the Jew Hillel Safran, my father, to move in at night between such and such places. And there is another one which authorizes uh, him and his family to, to live in a certain place in Slotrup. So my mother and I were in that labor camp. My, so was my father, but he had some mobility. Meanwhile, an uncle was in the forest in a partisan group. Uh, two family members, uh, the one surviving grandparent, a grandmother, and her oldest son, the one who had been shot in the hand, were in hiding in town in a so-called bunker carved out underground passages under a house somewhere. They survived uh, the war that time. The war. Uh, the war meant different times to different things, but for us, the bad time was the beginning of July 41, when the Nazis came in, to June 44, which is almost a year before the war ended in Europe. But June 44 is when we were freed by the Red Army marching back. June 44 was when the Allies a landed in Normandy. So this was still be well before the end of the war. But the Russians were already winning. All of 42 the year in which I became five years old, we remained in that labor camp. The labor camp was called Latske. And the story of the labor camps remains to be written. The extermination camps, for good reasons, have attracted much more attention from historians 
but the labor camps were all over. And there is a description of one of these labor camps in a recent book, uh, The Diary of Abraham Goldfard, edited by Wendy Losser, which matches what my mother told me about the labor camps. We stayed there apparently the whole year, and the labor camp, which my mother says, said, my mother's no longer alive, uh, said was 300 to 500 people, moved with the construction project every few months. And apparently, during one of those motions, it came close to a village called Unyov in Polish, and Univ now in Ukrainian, a small village of maybe 200 people, 50 wooden houses, one brick house, a schoolhouse. And my parents, apparently, m my father met, and they both talked to, everyone was trying to get a place to hide. Parents were politically active, sensitive. People had a few people had escaped from the concentration camps, came back telling of the extermination. Nobody wanted to believe them. But my parents knew that they had to get out of the ghetto. Uh, w we weren't in there, and that's how we survived, in fact, the whole group. Uh, the ghetto was eventually liquidated. People in 42, they were beginning, the apparatus of the extermination camps began to work. And by 43, people were being shipped off to these. So, for instance, the ghetto was liquidated in sometime in 43, the ghetto of Zlocho, the town we were. This little village, Unyov, which I mentioned, is about 25 kilometers from Zlocho, just 15 miles away or so. When the ghetto was liquidated, I lost two other grandparents and an aunt, uh, and I don't know when we lost the other aunt. Oh, I know, actually, I do know. And we were not in that. We were in this labor camp. My parents talked to this Ukrainian school teacher who was the most educated man in this small village. In the villages were ethnically segregated. There were Polish villages, there were Ukrainian villages. There were some people of other nationalities in there, but they tended to be ethnically uh, homogeneous. They talked to this man, and he was, I only found out more lately, an educated person. He spoke, everyone spoke Polish and Ukrainian. He spoke also German, had apparently been educated according to his children at the university in Prague. During the war, he also served as some sort of spokesman to the village uh, because he spoke German for the village to the Germans. He was a school teacher. This was a one-room schoolhouse, 200 people. Maybe there were 30 kids in the village or something like that. And they were all educated in one place. There was a schoolroom in front, two storerooms, one of which was rented out to a person who worked in the forest, and a school teacher lived in the same house in back. And he agreed to take us in. His name was Mikola Duke. His wife was Maria. He was 20 years older than his wife. And uh, he was in his 40s at that time, I believe. They had three small children, the oldest of which, a boy, was exactly my age. So that uh, when we went in was, there was January 43, we went into hiding. At that point, I was five and a half. Your father was still in the camp, though, at that time, correct? Yes. So we bribed the guards, and my mother and I got out of the camp as did an aunt and an uncle. The aunt and an uncle had a two-year-old. It was judged that the two-year-old would cry too much, or would not keep quiet. But it was judged that I would could keep quiet. I was a quiet child. Um, and that two-year-old was given 
to a Polish family and perished along with the family during the war. So those are the kind of choices that were made. You put a child not in hiding or you take them along. In the end, there were five of us. My father did remain in the camp, but it was thought that he would uh, eventually join us in hiding. He was one of the leaders of an attempt to break out of the camp. A story of armed resistance. There, are, there were others. Behind that is again being politically conscious and knowing that you have to resist in some way. They got weapons into the camp from the people in the forest who had the weapons from uh, caches that the Russians had left behind. And my father, with some access into the camp, brought in in his briefcase uh, guns grenades disassembled and then they brought those into the camp he remained in the camp and once a month or so my mother said came to visit us so I did not see my father except on an occasional visit from when from the end of 42 when I was five and a half and then in June 43 the attempt to break out of the camp was betrayed by another Jew and the leaders were arrested and they were tortured and shot in Zwachov in the town, killed. Um, we found out about this when we got two letters. First of all, he didn't come one time when he should have come. My mother was terribly worried. He would come at night uh, actually, people knew where someone was hidden. This was a terrible risk. There were two letters that came to us while we were in hiding. One was from my mother's mother, and the other one from a friend of my father's telling of his death. And my mother cried. Um, and I think I didn't know what, what this meant much, but I cried with her, of course. I was at this point, the end of June, almost six. The uncle from the forest came into hiding with us, so in the end, we were five people. Two uncles, the wife of one of them, an aunt, my mother, and I. Uncle Frank from the forest we called him Fromche. He had a gun. I didn't know till that till afterwards. Um, he was, um, I think the gun was intended to kill ourselves if we were discovered. Kill us. It never came to that. We were in an attic. I later have been in that attic. That attic is still there, though I'm quite sure it has been rebuilt. Because what I remember was that you could stand up, that the uncles, the grown-ups, I could stand up anywhere, but the grown-ups could stand up only in the middle. And the attic is now bigger. And you know, as a child, you remember things are bigger than they are. So I think uh, this must have, uh, this it, it, the attic looks new, but. Did you understand at that age or have a kind of grasp on why you had to hide, why your family had to hide? I mean, uh, especially, you know, in the play that you write and, and certainly you describe, you know, the police character of looking out at the kids playing yes. and, and, you know, looking between the, the wood the wood slats and not yes. being able to see the full movement of the plane. But as a child, do you... Is it as an as an do you accept your circumstances or do you have a, a grasp of I mean why you ha and and your family has to hide while you see other families yes. you know not in, in hiding so there was there were it looks like there were two windows at the end of this long attic which ran over 
those rooms on the first floor. One window faced the street. The other window faced a yard and back where the children played and where there was an outhouse um, for the kids use. This place didn't have a bathroom till 2000, um, the school. We didn't leave the house. We left the attic after about eight months. We survived one winter. It was fairly open to the elements, as attics sometimes are. And we survived one Ukrainian winter, the winter of 40, 43, 42, 43. Uh, we, it was judged we wouldn't be able to make another winter. So we moved sometime toward the fall of 43 into a space on the ground floor which was a storeroom, maybe six by nine feet. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But up in that attic, there were one of the windows was covered up permanently. And the window toward the back, I'm pretty sure now. I wasn't sure until I saw the attic recently. That was covered with wooden slats, which were open to the elements, but and they were fixed. And you could... And they were... I think slanted up like this, so there wasn't that much looking down. You could see on your whole field of view was divided up into horizontal strips, which were fairly narrow. But I could see the children playing outside. And uh, that was a terrible... At times I forgot myself I wanted to be with them. But... <sighs> We knew the the cho uh, we knew the Nazis were evil. There wasn't much good said about the Ukrainians yet they Ukraine because they worked with the Nazis often. That's another story we can come back to of Ukrainian Jewish relationships. But the Poles were generally thought of as better people with respect to the Jews. Everything was seen in terms of us and them. I didn't know why th all those people were out to kill us. And I don't think I saw much of death or I was shielded of it. But I think I must have seen some in a labor camp. And maybe in the 42 days. And certainly that my grandfather was killed. But Children survive uh, unspeakable conditions. Uh, Jerzy Korzynski's novel, The Painted Bird, though the part of it is a constructed story, tells some of the terrible conditions under which kids survive. They're very resilient. Uh, perhaps they invent some stories. In my case, the survival was made easy by an environment of great love in this group right around me. And maybe also some feeling that here were some people who were protecting us, the Ukrainians, well, giving us a place to hide. We paid them, but they hid us at great risk to their lives. They could have been shot. And they had three small children. Uh, but I was Im surrounded by an immediate family group. And my mother... She invented games all the time. She taught me how to read in the attic. All the reading had to be done, or most of the reading had to be done, by the light, by the little light that came through that window. We were afraid to light a lamp. We actually had a kerosene lamp, I believe. But we were uh, told not to light it at night because um, people would discover that we were there. Perhaps they would see the light. So um, it was a schoolhouse. In the attic was stored books. Among them were atlases. From that came a time of, uh, I learned how to read an atlas. My mother taught me, and we played endless games she invented to keep me happy. I'm sure there must have been times where I had temper tantrums and cried. I don't know how she ma how she managed to keep me so quiet. Somehow, 
I knew what to do in those circumstances, which was to keep quiet. Um, but I was a normal child, pretty normal. I was pampered as the only child in there. I mean, it's not only my mother, it's my aunts and uncles who also played games with me. Games on paper. There was paper and pencils. There were school books and maps. One of the games my mother played with me that I remember to this day was geography games where she would say, one game was wet and or dry, and she would say, this is now to a six, seven-year-old kid, she would give me a latitude and longitude, she taught me this, and I would have to say whether it's water or land. So I got pretty good at geography at that time. It was, uh, and then she would play a game like, tell me how to go from where we are to Montevideo in Uruguay. And I would have to describe, I couldn't just say you go on a boat. I'd have to say, first you have to get to the port, which was Gdansk in Poland, Danzig. And how we get there by a railroad that we go to this place, then we change to another place. And then I'd have to describe all the bodies of water. As we went around Denmark, the answer wasn't right until I got the names of all these places, uh, Skagerrak, uh, Öresund, these, the names of the bodies of water in the Baltic Sea around Denmark. And then I'd have to make a decision whether to go by the Panama Canal or not to Montevideo, I wouldn't go by the Panama uh, and, and those were, I remember those games, and I loved the geography that we did. And I certainly, in, in your play, you have Elise and, and Frida uh, doing very, so you know, almost uh, exactly what, you right. what you've described to yes. me. And you mentioned earlier that your mother was trained as a, as a school teacher, yes. but never, never practiced. You know, practice it. But in essence, she really did. With you know, one child, <laughs> one yeah, child school. But certainly that's a very valuable. Uh, she was thing. also a strong woman. She was a small, strong woman. She lived till 94 and died in, in Manhattan just six years ago. Um, and she, her story, it's amazing the strength that she had. She suffered in World War One. There's a story of <laughs> this is this is a part of the world that things happen which Americans cannot imagine. Nin she's born in 1911. 1915, she's four years old. She and her brothers are put on a train to get out of advance by some Austrian troops into Russia. There, her father is had been drafted into the Russian army. It was somehow the Russians came in and she, the three children and the nurse get separated from the mother by the advancing front line 1911, are sent to an orphanage in Vienna, to, an, to a nunnery. And the parents don't know where the children are. The children don't know where the parents are. My mother lived for three years when she was a child. Um, that was 1911, in these terrible, what we imagine, circumstances. They actually, the nunnery was very friendly. She has good memories of it. Uh, and she has a scar. She had a scar from some boiling water that spilled on her from a, a soup in, in that place. But here, that was 1911. Here, 30 years later, she's facing the war and her husband's death. Let me go on with the story a little bit to get the general perspective, then we can go back to some specific things. We move down to the ba to the first floor. The war goes on. The Soviets are coming back. It was clear they were going to come back. And then we remain there till June 44. S the Russian advance stalls nearby. It was decided we should nevertheless leave there. At this point, there are German troops in, in that schoolhouse. Um, it was dangerous. We had dug out a, we had lifted up the floorboards, dug out in the earth a bunker, 
place to hide when the police came to the schoolhouse. We would go there in this hiding place where there wasn't room to stand. We'd just sit on a bench, all five of us. And uh, Duke, Nicola Duke, would move boards across the top and move a cupboard over it, and so it was hidden. Um, we did that a few times. I remember the smell of the wet earth from staying down there. We were we walked across to the Soviet lines, across muddy fields. The men were weak. My the women were stronger. They had not walked. They tried to exercise in this little space, but you couldn't. You weren't allowed to move too much. We walked across to the Soviet lines and came back to the town of Zlochev in uh, June '44. We remained there till the end of 44, and following the Soviets advancing west, we moved first to a town, I think in December 44. We have a picture of me. The first picture after the war is from an identity document in fall of 44. I'm seven years old at this point. Uh, we came back to the house. The house was ransacked, but standing where we were, uh, we were greeted by comments like, so they didn't kill you after all. It was not a friendly return. We recovered some photographs. That's where I have some photographs from before the war. And in December 44, we moved to what we were sure would not become the Soviet Union. So the Soviets' intentions to move the borders of Poland were already voiced. The war wasn't over at all. And we moved to Przemysl, where I think I got very sick uh, with uh, measles and was nursed. I remember lying in bed for a long time. Medicine was in short supply. In the beginning of '45, we moved to Krakow, just after the Germans had liberated Krakow. The war is still four months so from being over. And I went for the first time to school. I had missed the first grade. The only schools operating in the days shortly after the liberation of Krakow were the Catholic schools. And um, I, uh, some agreement was reached between the priests and my parents that I was um, going to be educated as a Catholic. And so I went to second and third grade in the school in Krakow. The future Pope, uh, John Paul II, was uh, a teacher in a neighboring school. I remember, I wasn't Jewish, I wasn't Catholic, but I, I, w I knew I wasn't Catholic, but why I... Why was the decision made to educate you? It was just, it was time to go to school. Oh, okay. Uh, so, more from an educational right. standpoint. Right. And the state schools weren't operating. Oh, okay. So, the church functions when things don't function. Um, in Poland, certainly. The, the church ran its own autonomous system, certainly on education. My best grades were in catechism. I was a choir boy in church. I had my first communion. I went through all the experiences of a young Catholic boy that are so well described in Fellini's Amarcord movie. Um, how you choose what priest you confess to because some are harsher than others. And my mother was remarried to a man she knew from before the war who had lost his wife in the war. His name was Margolius, last name, Naftali Margolius. And so I became Roald Margolius. And then after a year, we decided to go west with the aim of going to the United States. It was better, just like people today in Bangladesh and in Zambia know the U.S. immigration laws, so we knew about the McCarran Walters Act and that there were quotas, and there were bigger quotas for Germans than there were for Poles. And we knew it was better to be German for getting into the United States. So we bought the documents a village priest in Silesia, the German, the Poles were anxious to drive the, 
the German ethnic population out of Silesia, now Western Poland, then about to become part of Poland. So they made life uncomfortable. The village priest in a small Silesian village, Mid Mittelwalde, um, didn't have any money to run his parish. He he made a good business which hurt nobody. He sold the birth certificates of Germans, of his parishioners who had been killed in the war. And so Paul Hoffmann became, sorry, Naftali Margulius became overnight Paul Hoffmann, made himself a few years younger, which we thought was better for being an immigrant, but later caused trouble when he wanted to collect Social Security in the United States. And you uh, were how old at this time? I was eight. And did you, how did you feel about having to kind of take on this German identity? Didn't feel a thing. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing at all. That didn't, the irony of that did not hit me till later. If my parents did it, I didn't. Right. Um, how did your mother feel? Don't know. She I think, spoke I think they were very, so... Or it was just the such a survival thing. It was a survival thing. And there there are a number of things that go into this. But first of all, the reaction of the survivors or one question is, what is the reaction of the survivors forever after toward Germans, Ukrainians, Poles, the other people around? And... Another question is, what is the reaction of others who did not suffer, or the second generation of survivors? I can, I can only speak for my parents. Uh, my parents had no, my mother had no trouble with, not too much trouble with Germany. She would talk about the terrible things that she had with the Nazis. But she, she went back to Germany a number of times after the war. She never wanted to go back to where we were born. And she had a lot of trouble with the Ukrainians. Every time she talked about the Ukrainians, uh, she said those murderers in the next word. Um, and I, I have that, that in the play. Frida in your play. That's right. I mean, so she that's certainly, that's her especially dialogue. in the in Act One of the play, yeah. every time a Ukrainian is yes. brought up. Now, she also knew how to behave, so she didn't uh, do that in the presence of a Ukrainian. <laughs> so, but I think that the reason that they felt so negative about the Ukrainians is the Ukrainians were their friends and neighbors in as much as you could have in an ethnically pretty segregated community, which is obvious from the way even that I just said it in the beginning, that there were 4,000 Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews. They thought of themselves as such. But the Ukrainians betrayed them badly overall, and that actually somehow there was this common enemy of all of them, the Nazis. And but people's, people's opinions get changed by politics, memory, reconstruct. I'll give you an example, another total direction. The Soviets freed us. We owed our lives to their defeating the Germans. We would have been waiting for the Americans at D-Day for ages. They didn't free us. Nevertheless, my mother's attitude to the Soviets, she didn't think of them as murderers, but was very bad. And the reason it was negative about Russians and Soviets, I mean, she thought of them as anti-Semitic, and yet Jewish culture flourished in Russia in the pale of the settlement. But the reason is that the Soviets, after initial support, turned against Israel and supported the Arabs. So that subsequent political action, I am sure, turned my uncles and my mother against the Soviets so they, they forgot the freeing and the sacrifices the Soviets made to 
the greatest losses in World War II by far, 20 million people perhaps. As a child though, this didn't have any, not to say that it didn't have any impact on you, but no, not in the same way as, a, as an adult. I mean, again, you were a child. You impact of the Nazis. Meaning like or the formation of your political type of, uh, or even viewpoints of, uh, of different ethnic cultures. Oh, children are so resilient. Maybe I forgot. Uh, I don't, you know, I didn't, I, I felt positive about the Soviets, but part of it was a kind of innate left-leaning thing. I thought communism, socialism were in the right direction, though I avoided real engagement with, it, with that as a young person. Um, and I think in general young people are left-leaning, though, though not, not there are exceptions. Um, toward the Nazis and Germans, I don't know. I, I in part in my life, there was another factor which overcame it later in life. But I don't think I was against the Germans, the Nazis, of course, a terrible story. But later in life, when I became a, pr a chemist, a professor, um, the largest group of my foreign scientific co-workers, these are postdocs largely coming here for a year or two, has been German. And I have had working with me over the years some 22, 23 bright young people. So these are now all of them born after the war, essentially, though actually some are were born during the war, above my age, but mostly younger. And the those young people and their attitudes and their enthusiasm and somehow have shaped another image of Germany for me. And I have no trouble working with them. Sure, when I go to Germany and I see an old person, I wonder what they are doing. And they are not likely to have told their children in the mechanisms of repression of memory and self-justification. Uh, I. It's actually still for me even worse with the Ukrainians because in the process, for instance, of going back to the town where we were and trying to raise memorials, we had to deal with Ukrainian town administrators, the members of the city council of Zwachov. And we and they are a curious mix and they they refuse to give us back the old Jewish ceremony uh, cemetery and we had to bribe them to, to get memorials up there. And we look at them and they are, a, they are a curious mix of ultra-nationalists and apparatchiks, old-time communists who changed their spots and now have become nationalists. And they cannot see behind, beyond their nose. That's why actually I enlisted the help of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which is Greek Catholic Church, which is, has a much more broader outlook in getting us those memorials. But so there is no mechanism of remembering the Holocaust and the sad Ukrainian participation in some aspects of it is not taught in the schools. It's still taught, I mean, what's taught is World War II when the history is taught. Total contrast to Germany, uh, where Germany, the kids are taught a lot about the Holocaust and German participation. And I've seen that in the schools, and I've also, from talking to these postdocs of mine, I can see their education. So there is no forgiving without remembering. One has to remember those times. Well, you and you wrote about that in in the article yes. uh, that uh, about your visit back. Yeah. Uh, and you and you make that statement. You know, you can't forgive without right. remembering. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you talk about the difficulty of your own memories. 
you know, from, uh, from that time. Memories are shaped, reshaped by circumstances. Let's take a break for a moment. Right Absolutely. Here. Okay? Yes. Okay. So let me finish the story yeah. of what yes. happened because we're we're only in 1945 and we've got four years to go till we come to America. So in 45 we're in Krakow. Uh, we change our papers from, and I become Roald Hoffman. I think my uncles forge a wedding certificate for one of them for my mother and Paul Hoffman, my real father disappears from the picture and we uh, leave Poland quasi-legally at the end of 45 beginning 46 we're in um, Czechoslovakia which was then an independent country we declare ourselves refugees stateless we are sent to we go to Austria next where we are in a, what's called a DP camp DP stands for displaced persons. These are camps run by jointly by UNRWA, United Nations Refugee Agency, and Joint, which is a Jewish charity from the mainly financed from the United States. Ours is in Linz, in an old German army base. And now I go to my um, to another school where everything is taught in Yiddish and I have some pictures from there and the kids in that school are of all ages I'm the youngest I only missed one grade there were kids in there who had missed five years of school during the war so that's why they were of all ages we're taught in Yiddish German is outside we learn German we actually I knew some German at this point I knew Polish and Ukrainian also because Ukrainian was spoken in in the part where we were uh, I begin to learn Hebrew. We spend 46 there, and I think in the beginning of 47, we move to Germany, to another displaced persons camp, a place called Wasseraltingen. At this point, I'm almost 10. We wanted to go to the United States. My grandmother, the only surviving grandparent, had a sister in the United States. It was difficult to get in. There were the quotas were small, but uh, slowly bunches of refugees were admitted. We almost went to South America, which offered labor contracts to people, and that's many Jews wound up. Many in Argentina, which was also home to Nazis, but also all over South America and Latin America. And we almost went, I forget whether it's Peru or Chile, one of those two places. We almost went to Israel. Israel was being founded as a state in 1948. But we waited out. We moved in 48 to Munich. And for the first time, we got out of a, one of these camps. And we lived in a luxurious apartment, which had been that of a German army officer, on the main street, the Maximilianstrasse in Munich. I went to a school where everything was taught in Hebrew and to prepare people for going to Israel. I learned my first English was taught from Hebrew to English in Germany. This is all bizarre. But I, there is an English class there, and I, I knew some English, a very little at that point. Finally, the visa comes through for coming to the United States, and on February 49, on President's Day, I'm 11 and a half. We land in Boston and then take a train to New York City, where our relatives were. I come to the United States. And then we lived happily ever after. <laughs> the, the United States was a great place. And my mother always said, don't say anything bad about America. Anyway, we came to the United States. Uh, we lived in Brooklyn and in Queens. I went to public schools in New York to one of the science-oriented 
schools in New York, Stuyvesant High School. Um, interesting, today the population is three quarters Asian American. That time it was three quarters Jewish, first or second generation immigrant. The kids are the same. <laughs> it's different. The aspirations are, are there, different popu ethnic group. I went to Columbia to college, then to Harvard to graduate school. And this is my third Ivy League school, Cornell. This is my only job. I've had been here for 40, 47 years. So everything went very well. I have a sister who was born in the United States, so we have the same mother but a different father. She is 17 years younger than I am, and she's the assistant attorney general of the state of New York and has been works in Manhattan and uh, she has a family we're going down there for Thanksgiving uh, we'll meet up the whole family and uh, I am married I have a wonderful wife who is actually from Sweden and two children and three grandchildren so I think in fact the world has been very nice after those initial years uh, those were difficult years I saw, I mean, your expression changed, certainly, when we, when you talk about coming to America yes. and your educational <laughs> opportunity, I mean, you're beaming, you know, yes. right now. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to be happy about those days, but I should tell you that after the war, being the feeling of freedom was immense to be able to play outdoors. But there was also lots of fun to play in bombed out bunkers and to rummage through some rubble of things. Kids are, are amazingly resilient and uh, I have good memories of the time. Being a child in those four years of being a refugee, but there are very few good memories from when we were in Haiti. And now, why do you think, or what kind of led you to the path to be a scientist? I mean, you talked about certainly the, the science school that you had attended yes. when you first came to the United States, but when did you kind of discover this aptitude that you, uh, that you had for it? So, the path to chemistry was not straight. The path towards science, I think, was pretty directed. There was a good bit of family talk about becoming a doctor. This was a good thing. But there were ambiguous feelings about doctors voiced in the family that a sensitive kid would pick up. Doctors were also out after money, and they didn't know anything. Um, and But there was a certainly family, I would say, pressure to become a doctor. Um, science, I played with chemistry sets. I had a distant relative who gave me some chemical equipment to play with. Uh, but the only advanced placement course I did not take at the science-oriented school was chemistry. I took physics, math, and biology. I uh, started out college at Columbia as a pre-med, um, so certainly I had to take a lot of chemistry courses. Didn't then I worked up the courage to tell my parents that I wasn't going to be a doctor. Meanwhile, the world was opening up through to the arts and humanities, through a general education core course, which really worked wonders for me at Columbia. And I followed it up by courses in great books and art history. And I really loved those things. The chemistry teaching was boring. The only thing that kept me going... Oh, so I didn't think I was good enough for physics, which was wrong. I was good enough for physics, as I because now I'm working very close to physics. But it was just I saw my there were some friends of mine who were. When I got A's in physics, they got A pluses, and it just came easier to them. I knew I wasn't good enough for math, and that's true. And biology, for some reason, I think because of this fighting going to medical school, I decided biology wasn't for me. Be, but it was a. It was in high school. I think I just, I, I did chemistry research. So I think the research in the summers at Brookhaven National Laboratory 
National Bureau of Standards, though that pulled me into chemistry even when the teaching wasn't best. So I, but I think I didn't decide to be a chemist until halfway through a PhD in chemistry. Be that is, even at Harvard in graduate school, I sat in on a number of other classes. And second, I, I went off to Russia for a year to the Soviet Union on an exchange. At this time, I was married. I think that year was maybe a, a way of escaping a decision about chemistry. I was studying chemistry there, but I was more studying Russian. When I came back at age 21 uh, or so, from, uh, no, when I was 24, from, uh, from that year in the Soviet Union, I was dedicated to chemistry. And so, so the way to science was somehow through d being interested in science, maybe being shy, thinking about ideas, but certainly I could have gone into art history. Well, you mentioned that in the materials that yes. you had sent me, that at one point you I had loved uh, it. even considered a, an art about history. It. Yes. Those are the intellectually most exciting things I did. So I was intellectually oriented. I wasn't practically oriented. I wasn't, I, I didn't have maybe other passions. Do you think that can be kind of traced back to the time and hiding where much of your time was spent in very much these intellectual type of exercises well with, your, uh, with, your mi with your mother? It was a forced contemplative environment. Right. I mean, we were sitting there and reading. Uh, that was all there was to the world. I couldn't play outside. I don't know, Peter. I don't know if... Um, what else can be traced to that time? There are some things that can be traced. Uh, I'm not sure that the, the science direction can be. Um, there are many people from Jewish background who have become scientists. You know, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes I'm asked, why is that so, or why are Jews so good at science. It's like asking why are Asians so good at science today. <laughs> so you you need a, there are many things and some of the things are good and some of the things are not so good. Uh, the the um, There is something from that background which I was going to mention in the process. So one is you have to come from a tradition that, that respects learning and book learning in particular. And it's not for nothing they were called the people of the book. Incidentally, that is, uh, uh, comes from the Koran, that phrase. Uh, it was Muhammad who called them the people of the book. But also, the in it is, uh, is you had a society which was 100% male literate in the time of Christ. That was not many societies who could say that at that time. Um, it's true, women were not taught to read in, the, in those times, the Hebrew text. The other, th so you have a respect for learning. You have um, family traditions will push you on, but the, you can see that in the Asian American immigrants who are uh, today just as well. Um, you are an immigrant, an outsider. As an outsider, you watch, you are careful. You may not have the words to express yourself. The first steps you take are in areas where the expression is not so much in words, but maybe in equations or in formulas of some sort. But also the watching from outside and trying to figure out how something works inside the society before you make a fool of yourself. Nobody wants to make a fool of themselves. There's something about that watching which is um, similar to what a scientist does. We're, we're watching nature, observing, probing it, maybe in, we're not doing it. The analogy breaks down at some point. But there's something about being an outsider that actually I think is related to, to science. And do you think also like the kind of being an outsider or uh, of an immigrant status allows you to appreciate the opportunities 
more so than uh, than as somebody who kind of almost takes it for granted the opportunities presented to them. Yes, and also the you can see that education is the way in into the society if you don't have the money, let's say. And you're not going to be popular. You're not going to be as an immigrant unless you have a very special personality. You can't make the jokes as an immigrant. You can't show humor uh, is the most difficult thing. You, you, it's on, you, you're sort of led to become a nerd in some <laughs> way <laughs> uh, because it's, it's the way into that society. You're not going to be the most popular person in the class. So I think there is something there. Then there is another thing, which are sometimes about Jews and science. That uh, okay, so the 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 transition to becoming good in science comes when you drop your religion, by and large. Uh, and if you, but you cannot drop your religion so fast. You think you're dropping it, but there is something. You have to replace it maybe by another passion, maybe another religion. Maybe, just maybe, psychoanalysis, socialism, and science were those re religion replacements for Jews in the 20th century. Um, now, and again, not to get too kind of big picture about that, but do you think that it was almost a necessity because of such anti-Semitism that existed. It was the necessity to almost abandon a religion as a means of a, yes. of a, of a you know, formulation of your personality and looking for these, uh, these other... Yes, it was a necessity and it was painful and, and it was diff uh, there, were, there were restricted numbers in admissions to schools. My father barely got in with some help from somebody into the engineering education. There were very few Jewish students in that. Whereas medicine, there were more, but still there were pressures. Both my, my stepfather, my mother, and one uncle had to leave the country, not had to, left the country, Poland in that case, to get an education. My uncle wanted to become a dentist. He, he couldn't get into a dental school in Poland. He had to go to France uh, to get a dental education. So there were, there were, and you certainly, you couldn't remain religious and be a student. There was uh, in the, at a Polish university, so you had to assimilate. Why did you? And and when I ask this question, I don't. I want to be careful how I ask this, but why did you keep the name Hoffman? I mean, had you ever oh. thought of being able to go back to your either uh, your birth name? Well, at some point? yes, and actually, at some point, at some point, not too long after we came, a granduncle died intestate. Granduncle Safran died here in this country, and I was entitled to some fraction of. He owned a liquor store on Staten Island, in Richmond Avenue. We had to go into court to prove that I was Safran to get $5,000 inheritance, which was a lot of money in those days, 1951, 52. We did that. It was a calculated risk. Otherwise, to go away from Hoffman, the main reason, I think, was, uh, though maybe one could have managed it, it was, uh, there was a risk of, raising illegal immigration issues through this paper story. Now I tell you the story because no one's going to deport me. And anyway, I was a child at the time. Second, it might have been a sign of disrespect. It would have been only me who would have changed the name. It perhaps it would have been a sign of disrespect to my stepfather. And though there were times he and I didn't get along, but it was not in that degree. But that wasn't certainly his given name. No, that was his name was Margulius, so right. it's complicated. Right. Uh, but to go and then finally, uh, I did think a little about it later, but by that time I had started publishing under Hoffman and I didn't want to change the name. So I think 
this it's not this assumed identity it uh, it just doesn't bother me as something we had to do in difficult times mm -hmm. and it's okay now when you became a chemist halfway through your PhD you yes. decided <laughs> yes I decided to be a chemist I can't imagine that uh, the Nobel Prize was ever in your uh, in your kind of uh, career goal planning how well, did that come about well it it was not but it may have been a dream so let me put it another way okay. uh, tell you a story um, it's only young people who can um, thinking realistically and rationally can say I would like to get a Nobel Prize so why can't older people though some people are obsessed by it some fellow scientists they're being irrational it's okay if they're irrational but the reason they're being irrational is that in any year the Nobel Prize is given people always ask me before who do you think will get it and I and also I nominate people myself in any year it's given I can think of 20 or 30 people who deserve it deserve it and who I think the community would be happy with if they got it but yet only three will get it so what you realize is you can aspire to be a good scientist and to do work deserving of Nobel Prize but in the end it's a group of five or six Swedish scientists with their own backgrounds and prejudices and with a lot of research who decide on this it's worse in literature you can and there you it's so obvious that why does uh, some people like Norman Mail and Tony Morrison get it but why does Philip Roth not get it I mean it's bizarre and so anyway you cannot rationally aspire that but human beings aren't all rational so uh, in fact I think at that time somebody asked me one time in a cafe at age 17 and they reminded me afterwards of uh, what in a part, part of some truth game uh, they asked me what do you want to do and I said at age 17 I'd like to get an Nobel Prize and but after that I knew it was not it was something not you could rationally by and I I what didn't become obsessed by it of course it was interesting to find out and also I knew that we had been nominated so this is the difference between um, between the chemistry science Nobel Prizes and some of the others is that everyone first of all you know y y first of all you know you've done good work you get other rewards from the community uh, invitation to lectures promotions other things bef uh, b before no it's a surprise to nobody it's a s it's a surprise because journalists want it to be a surprise and they manufacture the questions like when did you hear about it did it wake you up and so on but in our case even though I got it at a young age fo 44 I knew when I did the work that was rewarded I didn't know it was important I did not know it was important it was the work that was important it was the work the not work the prize. no but I didn't know the work was even important <laughs> when I did it Oh, a year or two later I did but after we did the work but when I did it I didn't know it was important I was just doing the next interesting thing and I've been lucky enough to do that in my scientific life but I knew we first of all we I did this work when I was 27 or so 27 to um, uh, to 28 or so to 29 we I knew that the work was important around that and the community knew the work was important um, around the time I was 32 to 33 
I knew I'd been nominated for the Nobel Prize within uh, two or three years of that. So why do you know you're nominated? It's not the Nobel Foundation tells you. It's your friends who nominate you tell you. They, the mystique ru they think the mystique rubs off on them that they've nominated you and they can't hold it in. They tell you. Or in the case of our case w where I got the Nobel Prize with a Japanese scientist uh, who fully deserves it and is a friend, Kenichi Fukui, his portrait is on the wall there. He's no longer alive. In his case, it was rather amusing since they were it was Japanese. Um, many countries have a a organization to make sure that everyone who might possibly get a Nobel Prize from that country gets nominated. America doesn't doesn't need to, but Japan did, and the Japanese scientists correctly decided that Professor Fukui should be nominated, but being Japanese, they went to Pr Woodward, who was my collaborator in this work. Woodward died before I and Fukui got the Nobel Prize. Woodward had already received the Nobel Prize. They sent a delegation of three people to Cambridge, Mass., from Japan to ask Woodward if it was okay to nominate Professor Fukui, together with Woodward and Hoffman, for the Nobel Prize. Woodward called me up afterward and said it was very funny. Uh, the, the whole story was interesting because they didn't send them to me. They went to the senior person, which is what made sense to the Japanese. Now, your, uh, your stepfather had passed two months prior to Two the months prior uh, to the Nobel Prize. Uh, your mother was there? Yes. How did, how did that feel for you? Oh, it was wonderful. We brought to that my wife's parents who were in Sweden. So first, the Nobel Prize felt special also because I spoke Swedish and I knew something about Swedish culture. So th the Swedish element, which doesn't affect other people, meant part of that meant something to me. Brought my uncle Yehuda from Israel, who was the only, the closest living relative on my father's side and his wife, and an uncle from the United States. And I brought my, my stepfather was not alive, but his sister came. And so we had all the three families represented in some way. So I think the really, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was uh, a recognition also of the survival in some way, but then what was sad was to think that um, here I was being recognized, but yet, and how few of us had survived, especially how few children. So there were 4,000 Jews, there were more than that, because we were swelled by refugees, but of those 4,000, 200 survived or so, about th that's typical Polish Jewelry. And you mentioned that you were one of, what, five children? Yes, in that something uh, like that. To survive. Yeah. Did in that, that town. When you, were, when you were receiving all this recognition yes. uh, regarding the Nobel Prize, and even at the ceremony, how much, how much did that come into play in, in, in your reflection upon, upon your, uh, your experience? Even though you were a small child, I mean, certainly the impact on, on your family. So there was just an inherent sadness in those who did not survive and a feeling that in some way I represented them in this setting. Uh, at the same time, the Nobel Prize celebrates achievement and but not an achievement, it's uh, for young people. It, um, the Nobel Foundation really invented the dream machine. It wasn't Sony. Uh, that was, it's, it's, a, it's a recognition of the good in human beings. So it was a time for, for reflection, for sure. And I thought of what it, it was wonderful to see my mother 
bask in, in that recognition that her son received. Uh, it was wonderful. My children were there. They were young. They were teenage at the time. And that was wonderful. So I wish my father had been there. I wish my stepfather had been there. Uh, but they were not. But that reflection, and that goes beyond just the Nobel Prize. That of goes course. into who you've become, you know, as a scientist, as an artist. Well, I, I am a speaker for the dead also. But I'm not obsessed by it. Someone had come to me a while ago and said, why don't we put out a book of your poems about the Holocaust? And I said, no. Because those poems are, it's not that I don't want to speak about the Holocaust, but there is a Holocaust industry of people who make a living out of speaking about this. And I don't want to be part of that. I want those poems are me. I'm not afraid to speak about them. Last week, on, or the week before, I was in Brooklyn at a Kristallnacht commemoration of the day when the Nazis burned synagogues in 1938, and I gave a talk about my story, the same story I've told you about returning to our town. I will speak about that if someone asks me but I'm not going to be identified in as much as I can influence it as that being what I do. So I want the poems about the Holocaust published along with other poems that I write. And I struggle to get those published. I have not written a biog autobiography, a memoir, I have written pieces of it here and there, probably most prominently in my poems. Uh, and I've had four books published, a number of individual poems. And I would say there are in there uh, 30 or so poems which speak of my childhood. Some an attempt to remember, some an attempt to think about times, like how did people, how did the people in a concentration camp and the guards think about each other? I wasn't in a concentration camp, but it, it, it didn't bother me, interested me. I've written a number of those poems into a play I've written recently, an autobiographical play about my mother and me. We are in the different names, and some of the facts are changed. And the play is set in a Polish-Jewish family, an immigrant family in Philadelphia in 1991, and there are flashbacks to hiding in the attic and in the storeroom that I told you about in 43 and 44. Almost every one of the 43, 44 passages is a poem. Someone said... Uh, I think it was Adorno, that you will never be able to write poetry about the Holocaust. Well, of course, that's not true. Uh, Paul Chalan and others have proven this. But I, to me, the poetry was a way to express itself and the play, that story. So that, that play is part of my working out. Perhaps I will write a biography. Well, that's what I wanted to kind of ask you about in terms of, I guess, when did you start writing? When did you start u utilizing kind of, again, your uh, renowned chemist, uh, yes. scientist? Uh, when did you feel this urge to for expression through poetry and, and your writing? When did that start? So I think the beginnings are in college, like everything else for me uh, on these things, on arts and humanities. There was a poetry course with Mark Van Doren, poet who taught the beat poets, taught Ginsberg and others, uh, and he taught us, he couldn't teach us how to write a poem in those days, there were no writing courses allowed, he taught us how to read a poem. I still remember uh, Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens when he read it for us and we talked about it. 
I thought a lot about poetry and I began to write only in midlife when I was around 40. I sent them out to be published. They came with rejection slips. I should have taken a course. I didn't. But I eventually found a group of people, including a wonderful poet here at Cornell, Archie Ammons, who also had a science background, was sympathetic to where I was coming from. And eventually my poems got better. So I began to, li to write at age 40. So I didn't write about my childhood in the first six or seven years. It was only about six or seven years later that at an artist colony in the 80s, um, yeah, I was around 50 uh, almost, that I began to write some poems which went back to that childhood time. And uh, I began writing and I was worried because I couldn't remember. But had I talked to a psychologist, they would have said, write and you will remember. But also when I wrote and I imagined, I must have been writing from some basic memory because when I read them to my mother, she said that's exactly how it was. But then she would say good things about anything I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you had written was. something that I thought was, was very interesting. You say, I write poetry to penetrate the world around me and to comprehend my reactions to it. Yeah. Well, so uh, comprehend the world around me. Don't I do science? Uh, isn't that enough? And yes, but there are some things which just cannot be answered on a scientific level. Uh, how to deal with grief or the end of love or something. What? There's no scientific answer to that. There's no solution. And maybe a poem, but then, then there could be another poem about that. I wish I could do more, I would do more poetry. I've done it on and off in the last years. Plays have taken a certain part. The science still remains so pervasive and so much fun. I haven't been able to make as much time for the poetry as I would like to. And, and another thing that, that you that I read and, and you touched upon and is that your notion that science and, and arts are not mutually exclusive. No. And yeah. there's this notion that they are, but yeah, your so is there that they I have a whole lecture on that, but uh, there are similarities and there are, there are commonalities, let us say, and there are differences. So the commonalities uh, is, first of all, it's, it's, it's a world. Um, there is a creation there. Now, it's true. Uh, there's a creation of the new. It Maybe I'm thinking as a theoretician that I'm creating frameworks of understanding. And, and that it, I'm, I'm not right away matching the discovery picture of science. But chemistry, anyway, is not so much about discovery but about making new molecules. Um, I think there is making something new. And Incident. And that's important in a dialogue with people in the arts and humanities because what is natural about a poem or a piece of music? They are man or woman made, they are artifactual, they are s synthetic, they are unnatural. Which raises an interesting question about ethics of creation, which scientists are not so good at. But w so we create new things. We value in both art and science an economy of statement, an intensity. Craftsmanship also is a very strong hallmark of creation. Um, the, there is uh, an intent to communicate the creation to other people. Poets will say they're dry writing for the drawer. I don't believe them. There's a difference between therapy and poetry. Poetry is meant for other people. Uh, as well as for yourself. Uh, is it a form of therapy, though? It can be to the poet, but that's. But it's so easy to tell poems that are therapeutic from poems that are written for other people. But I think they're trying to understand the world around us. So those are the commonalities, I think. I think also that there's a search for understanding in some way. There are differences. Uh, 
the role of ambiguity seems to have no role in science. You couldn't find out how those beautiful s gleaming steam engines in England worked until you defined heat and work very precisely and you founded the science of thermodynamics. And then you could understand why they worked only at 25 percent efficiency. Well, that a word mean two things and sound like ten other words, that's the stuff of poetry. So ambiguity is uh, also poetry and art in general functions from um, doesn't look after universals like equations e equals mc squared. Boy, that's boring. Uh, and uh, but you look at a blade of grass and a drop of dew on it, and you think about it, and it's that blade of grass and that drop of dew. And you can say something universal in it, as Archie Ammons did in a poet poem where he says, I look at that blade of grass and I see reflected in it myself and in me is my mind thinking about it. Anyway, you can, it's that blade of the specificity. The way into the world is through the specific in poetry and art in general. Uh, you mentioned your different. mother had the opportunity to read your poetry. Yes, she did. For it. Did, she, uh, did she get a chance to read uh, your play? No. Why did you write the play? I think I found it a, a good way to tell our story. Um, but also, I needed to... There are underlying questions of good and evil and of Ukrainian-Jewish relationships that I've been trying to work out and how to deal with, let's say, collective versus individual responsibility. This all sounds very abstract, but it's not there, and that's, th that's why I have to write a play. Those are I'm not writing an essay. I could also write an essay, but to me, creating these people, some of whom I could put my mother's words into, some of whom I had to invent, that somehow allowed me to deal with the question of the Ukrainians were not all evil, and, and, and to talk back to my mother, and I did. And my mother never said, did I ever teach you to hate, a line near the end of the play, a very important line. But I, that's what I felt she, she would have said. Did you ever have the opportunity to have the type of conversations with your mother the way that Elise was able to have with yes. uh, Frida? I think so, at times. Though there was the weight of so much stuff between us already that it's a play is, is a constructed conversation and a rather concentrated one. So I would say the conversations of many years are summarized in some play. I'm still thinking about this question of why did those people save us and what went into that. And we're we're working through this in a number of ways. W I we're in touch with the family of the people who saved us. We've been in touch except for nine years, just like it's told in a play. Um, and we visited with them. I went with my son once and with my s and, and sister and once with my daughter. And we are in touch with them. I j when we had now Hurricane Sandy, there was a message from the youngest member of the Duke family, a girl who was a college student in University of V. Sadly, studying Persic languages, Farsi and Iranian, for a girl in the Ukraine to do that was a little strange. Anyway, she writes, we're all worried about you. And then I answer, we're all okay, and then give them some family news, and then they give us some family news. And so we're in touch with the family, and it's important to us. Well, and, and why was it so important for you in 2006 to go back? 
there was a working up to that, um, but effectively we were, the most important reason is we were putting up memorials. And we put up in that year two, and in the following visit 2009, a third memorial to the death of the people. And we got back a large part of the Jewish cemetery. Uh, it's a sad story because the graves in that cemetery were still there after the war, my mother says. But now they're all gone. The gravestones are gone. We have the area, but it's bare. So it's, it's not the Nazis who destroyed the gravestones. It's the Ukrainians after town and the Soviets. We would, what I would like to do is to get some memorials to Jewish life. We're not going to reconstitute Jewish life as it was in that town. There may be a few hidden Jews among the, out of the 4,000 who are left there. Jews who become Ukrainians as such, we don't know. There are Jewish communities nearby towns. In that town there's nothing. There are these three memorials. There is a cemetery. There is a hotel that's been built on the site of the old synagogue. We're not going to tear the hotel down. We have the memorials, but what I would wish for is that in a local museum that there is a room celebrating Jewish life there, showing photographs which we can get of weddings, of children sitting in a religious school, sitting in a secular school. We have pieces of it. We have the graduates list from the local high school from 1931. It's on Polish, and half the names are Jewish. So from the names we can tell. We'd like, I'd like to see the memorials to that life. And we're told it's too expensive to put it up. And I think what's needed is money. We'll have to pay for it. You, you write Forgiveness comes from the soul. It's individual. Yeah. I can forgive, but only if I remember. Yeah. And importantly, if I see the people in whose midst the killing took place, remember. Yes. And and so you're you're saying that the the ability to forgive is tied directly to the ability to remember and uh, the events and and the people and the culture. And is that really what's behind a lot of your uh, intentions of wanting to construct these memorials so that people will remember and therefore will be able to forgive? I'm a a little bit sometimes of two minds about for remembering. I think a part of reaching a state of forgiving involves not only remembering but also forgetting. And one of the, and we naturally forget, I think. One of the terrible things in that part of the world everywhere is politicians, when people are forgetting already, politicians stirring up remembering for their own purposes. Let's push aside from the Jewish uh, Ukrainian thing to the Balkans and Croatia and Serbia. And you, s- you during the troubles there, you saw politicians calling up the Ottoman occupation of 500 years ago and how they oppressed us. People there had forgotten that. They had intermarried already. But by and large, remembering, I do believe that remembering and especially institutional remembering by schools and museums and such is is very important before one can forgive. I have met some people who cannot forgive, many people in our community. And in some way they're caught in a culture of victimhood and maybe an insuperable problem between the Ukrainian and Jewish communities. But I think one has to try. And part of that is recognizing that these peoples live together separately but together, and somehow interacted, okay, not without trouble, not without exploitation or hate at some points, and 
talking the other community down, but still they lived together for hundreds of years. And I think the recognition of the life that these are people like us in some way, who get born, who get married. I remember a photo photography show which had a great influence on me as a young person. It's called The Family of Life. It was a museum of modern art. It was a series of photographs of life stages, birth, uh, wedding, falling in love, children, death, across different cultures that have tremendous influence. I would like to see pictures of Jewish life shown in the same museum where there is a picture of Ukrainian life and independence. And they, they have their own country. It's very important. But that country also had a role in my life. And, and it's where my father is somewhere in that town, buried. We don't know where. We don't know where any, we know where my grandfather who was killed at the castle is there, but we don't know where my father lies. We don't know where that two-year-old child who couldn't come into the hiding with us, where she lies, and it's so important that we do that. So yes, I want people to remember, and I will do what I can. At the same time, I will not become obsessed by that memory. My life, my children, my German postdocs I mentioned to you, the young child of that family in the Ukraine, the young woman who was a college student whom we met, who was the grand, uh, sorry, the great granddaughter of the people who hit us out. I am a link in between these generations. They speak to the good in human beings. I think there is evil and there is good. I'm not a Manichaean. I think there is a time to remember the bad times and to recognize the good. Oh, thank you very much. Frank? Are you ready? I'm not ready yet, but that's okay. I don't have that picture here someplace, but it came in later. Okay, let me... Um, I'll begin at some moment. What's that? George? Mm -hmm. uh, so go ahead. George, do you mind if I lean in like this, or does that give you trouble for uh, getting in the no screen? No, that's fine. I just have it framed up so that we're just looking at the image. Right. So... I would like to show you just a few pictures from the attic in a schoolhouse where we were. So this is from the 2009 visit, and we're, we're standing in this village. I'm actually standing by the outhouse, which served the school for a long time. That building over on the right is a new one, but the one on the left is the original one, except we think it has a new roof and a new attic thereby, but the, the general uh, aspect is, is right. Here's the small village. You see these beautiful rolling hills. It doesn't look that different from Ithaca. Beautiful, beautiful country. And there's that schoolhouse, and there I'm standing and look, looking at it. From And now Igor Duke, who is the son of the man who hit us, he's the same age as I am. That's my sister in front. Um, He's pointing up to the entrance to the attic there. And here is here is the entrance, uh, the gangway or to the attic. And each day, Igor's father, Mikola, brought up some food through that entrance and took down a pair of slops. And there we were. And then uh, also, uh, when you say pair of slops, but the talk in the play about the bucket. The bucket, the, that's yeah. the bucket. Uh, that he took down. And here we are, and here's the attic, except I think it's been rebuilt because he's able to stand in much more of it. Uh, but there you see the window in front that was still blocked off the, to the street. Uh, now, it was cleaner than that. There were wooden planks on there. And as I said, there were school books stored. It was a storage room. 
But here is now toward the back, and you can see from the brickwork that that's been relatively recently done. And here, here is what I saw through the window, except there were slats. There are no longer slats. And during recess, the children would run and play there, and I would be in there. I couldn't have a clear view. That's the outhouse you see in there. There I'm standing by that. And how did, I mean, did that, this was the first time that you had been back. This did was it the first time. Did immediately bring back all the memories? From, I mean, 62 years later after we had left this place. It brought back some memories, but mostly I was trying to reconstruct how it was that it had changed rather than how it was the same. But this is this is the symbol of what there was there. You can see here the openness, the cracks, and that was this is the Ukraine. The Ukraine is like Ithaca uh, in terms of the severity of the weather, snow, ra rain. It was, I'm amazed we surprised, survived the winter up there. The heat was coming up naturally from the house underneath, but there wasn't that much heat. And then the storeroom on the first floor where we were, it was running around here. There was another room here. And we were in there, and it's those planks that were taken up, except they're new planks, of course, that to build the bunker underneath. And it was a cupboard like that that was moved over there. We were in that room. That room had no windows, as far as I remember. And we were in that room for uh, s eight months, I'm guessing, uh, till June 44. How much notification would you, would your family have, like, to be able to quickly, you know, get under the under for the floor? Some, some minutes, sometimes. The policeman would come around. And then when we went back, the room has been rebuilt. It's been converted into another classroom, and it's a chemistry classroom. I mean, can you imagine that? There is Mendeleev's periodic table, the elements, something about how you dissolve things and separate them, the elements, and there. Now, did you know that it had been a chemistry classroom before you? Uh, no. Did how, did that, how did that it's strike you? It just, I just couldn't imagine how fate had produced that. And the children in there don't know that I was hidden there. Now maybe the teacher tells them now, but uh, I don't know. We didn't make a I fuss about it at all. I thought it was just, inc I just was stunned to see that. We all were. This is the first picture of me after the war. This is the Polish identity document. That's what I looked like in November, December 44, a few months after coming out. Perhaps you look sad. And you are how old then again? Seven. Seven. Here is a year later in Krakow. My mother is well-dressed in her Persian coat. And I and here I am a schoolboy with long stockings and lederhosen, and I'm much happier. I'm smiling with a classmate. That's how we went to that Catholic parochial school. And here I am with my mother, and I'm, I'm back to being a normal boy. I recovered. This is the grave of the Dukes. Um, we went up there and read Psalm 23 for did, them. Did you ever go, I mean, this was the first time you ever went back after right. leaving, but was there... There was some contact with the family. There was so contact with the family since 1954. This is 2006, right. 42 years later. But you we never got to, your, did your mother never went back in person? My mother didn't want to go back. I wanted to go take her. I tried to go there several times during Soviet times, couldn't get permission, but uh, I could go after Ukraine became independent, but there were other reasons. We were trying to get back to the cemetery. The Ukrainians were resisting. They wanted me to come for publicity reasons. I didn't want to come until we got the cemetery back. So there were some politics, memories of Ukrainian nationalism. That's my daughter, Ingrid, staying in a bunker of a different kind that Ukrainian nationalists built, fighting the Soviets after the Soviets had reoccupied this. Next to Duke, there's a grave of five men who were killed on the same day, all in their 20s, in 1952. 
They were the Ukrainian nationalists, the same ones who had slaughtered Jews during the war. But 1952 is seven years after the Soviets had come back. They were still in the forest in one of these uh, things, places here, fighting. So this is this is those times. There's so m so many. It's so important for my kids to see that they heard these stories, but to stand there is very special. And we we value the contact with those people. Now I want to show you a couple of pictures from the Nobel Prize. Yeah, I'll have to switch for that. Just bear with me. The usual computer stuff. <laughs> um, So, jump backwards, forwards. We are now... This is 1981. 1981. Right. I'm 44 years old. This is the stage of the concert hall where the Nobel Prize is given. I've got lots more hair than I have <laughs> now. Uh, Do you still have the tuxedo? No, that was rented for uh, vacation. Uh, but I'll tell you something <laughs> about this. This is King... Um, King Gustav, Carl Gustav the Sixth, in proper costume, and Carl me, the Carl the Sixth Gustav, and he's giving me the uh, and uh, the medal and the an and the diploma, so to speak, and here and then. Uh, let's see, I have to control it this way. There's one more picture. It's me taking a bow here. Now, what I want you to to show to you, this is great. My mother's there, my wife is there, my children. It's wonderful. And there's both bust of Alfred Nobel. That's what this is. It's a wonderful thing. I'll come back to the memories, but what I want you to, you notice that there's a, a there's something about the pants mm -hmm. here and and they are also buckling here. So what happened was this. This is a formal outfit. There are suspenders, and I'd forgotten to put on the suspenders. And uh, my pants are falling down <laughs> while I'm saying hello to the king. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't go they all the way down. Lucky, <laughs> this would have been made the evening news. But I, only I can see it because I know what was what was happening. But I was worried about my pants. I think this is this is good <laughs> because it restores it restores a normal human being in you when, when you see, realize that this is right. <laughs> up there. And when did you realize that you had forgotten your suspenders? <laughs> when I was up there. Oh, when you were you're like, hey, <laughs> not when I stood up, but I <laughs> I was worried. Over there on the wall is a picture of Professor Fukui. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like a distinguished man. Comes from an aristocratic. Uh, Japanese family. He is there on stage with me, uh, and he was the first Japanese chemist to receive the Nobel Prize. And when did he pass? In the late 90s. He was a friend, colleague, a lot of respect. There was no competition at all. There was a lot of respect between us, and we were friends. And, uh, still are with his family. Um, R.B. Woodward, who did the important work that the Nobel Prize recognized, died two years before. Had he lived, our names and work were inseparable. Our names were inseparable in the work. It would have been his second Nobel Prize. Uh, the work was recognized. Again. He didn't live. My stepfather died two months before. But we had the family there. We had the children. So we, we go on. Do you keep, uh, they give you a medal or? Yes, I don't. The medal's in a bank vault. Mm -hmm. I don't have the medal. D the diploma's in a bank vault. Sorry, nothing to show for <laughs> it except me. Uh, oh, you have a reminder for a meeting coming up. Yes, and that 
is what computers do to you. <laughs> that's a research group meeting. So that's a reminder that I'm going to meet yeah. with the four or five people who are working with me. And they have bought a pizza for lunch. Uh -huh. And we're going to meet and uh, talk about the research. We're going to look at something from the literature. So 50 years after I started, the chemistry still remains interesting. Wow, I still get excited about it. Do you miss teaching? Yes, I do. I do miss the teaching. But it's okay. Thank you. Well, Rod, thank you very much. Thanks. It was a pleasure meeting you this morning and being able to take some time Thanks. to speak with you. And we appreciate your hospitality and accommodating all of our oh, equipment sure. and